Thank you. This uh, particular panel deals with the International Criminal Court and the crime of aggression. And we have a very distinguished panel here of uh, individuals who have a lot of experience both in uh, the diplomatic side and the uh, political side. I'd like to introduce them very briefly. To my left is Sarah Sewell, who is the Under Secretary of State uh, for Civilian Security, Democracy, and Human Rights. Uh, she formerly taught at uh, the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Uh, she was Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense and a Senior Foreign Policy Advisor to Majority Leader George Mitchell in the Senate. Uh, to her left is uh, Kurt Volker, who is the Executive Director of the McCain Institute for International Leadership, but formerly was the U.S. Permanent Representative to NATO. Uh, a Deputy Assistant Secretary for European and Asian Affairs, and a long career as a U.S. Foreign Service Officer. Uh, to my right is Morton Halperin, who is the Senior Advisor to the Open Society Foundations. He was formerly the Director of Policy Planning at the U.S. State Department and also had important positions uh, in the Department of Defense, the National Security Council, and the ACLU. And then to my far right is Christine Hansen, who is the Deputy Head of the International Law Department of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Denmark. Quite an impressive panel, I would say. Oh, and me, I'm Mike Matheson. I'm uh, teaching at George Washington, and I used to be the Acting Legal Advisor of the State Department. So, uh, the way I would like to start off is to give uh, just a very brief overview of the posture of the crime of aggression within the jurisdiction of international criminal tribunals. And as you probably know, uh, wars against aggression have long been considered to be an international crime for which there is personal criminal responsibility. Uh, it was a crime within the jurisdiction of the Nuremberg and Tokyo tribunals under the heading of crimes against peace. Uh, that was an easy case, of course, because the Axis uh, aggression was so obvious and clear, there really was no need for the, uh, those tribunals to go into a lengthy exposition of exactly what would constitute aggression or to address any of the less clear cases. Uh, after the war, there were attempts in the international bodies to uh, more carefully define uh, international law with respect to the use of force and aggression. The UN Charter, as you know, has a basic prohibition against the use of force by one state or against another, uh, against its uh, territorial integrity or political independence, or contrary to the other purposes of the UN. And the Charter gives to the UN Security Council the responsibility for determining when aggression occurs and what action should be taken uh, in consequence. Then there was a long attempt over many years under the auspices of the UN General Assembly to define this crime of aggression. And after many arduous years, uh, finally uh, it was produced in 1974, a definition of aggression. Uh, this definition uh, had a number of ambiguous statements about uh, what might constitute aggression. Uh, for example, it stated that the first use of force in contrary to the Charter would be prima facie evidence, although the UN Security Council might decide it wasn't uh, on the basis of other circumstances. There was a list of acts that might qualify as aggression, uh, including some obvious things like invasion and bombardment and uh, uh, the sending of armed bands into another state. Uh, but obviously these uh, actions would not be aggression if they were justified under the Charter. Uh, so uh, these ambiguities were probably deliberate in the sense that it was decided that they had to reach some kind of formula among disparate views. Uh, this definition doesn't resolve some of the more difficult issues that we've all been trying to deal with. Uh, for example, is there a right of anticipatory self-defense and if so, to what extent? Uh, is there a right of the use of force in humanitarian intervention uh, when the Council has not authorized it? And if so, to what extent? Then we come to the creation of the first uh, modern international tribunal, the Yugoslav Tribunal, in 1993. And we did uh, briefly consider whether to add aggression. Uh, and we decided not to. Why did we not? Uh, we felt that the primary focus of this new tribunal should be on the atrocities that were being committed on such a wide scale in Yugoslavia uh, and were having such a disastrous effect on regional peace and security. Uh, we didn't really want to divert the attention of that tribunal away from these atrocities uh, because we expected it would have limited resources and capabilities. Uh, we wanted to leave decisions about the lawfulness of a resort to force by the various parties in the Yugoslav tribunal 
to the, the UN Security Council on the one hand or to political negotiations among the states involved. And we were a little concerned that if the new Yugoslav tribunal became involved in such decisions, which had tremendous political consequences, then it might detract from the credibility and effectiveness of that tribunal. So for all these reasons, aggression was not included in the jurisdiction of the Yugoslav tribunal. Uh, nor was it included in any of the uh, hybrid tribunals that followed on during the course of the next decade. Uh, it wasn't until the negotiations for the International Criminal Court uh, came to fruition that the whole question of aggression was again raised and debated. And it was a matter of great contention in the uh, Rome Conference. Uh, the solution reached in the statute of the International Criminal Court uh, was to say that the uh, court would exercise jurisdiction, but only when agreement was reached defining the crime and establishing the conditions for its exercise. And that took another 12 years. Uh, and uh, those amendments uh, dealing with those questions were not really adopted until a Kampala conference in 2010. And here, uh, the result was that the court might exercise jurisdiction, but only after certain preconditions were taken. That is to say, there had, be a had to be a ratification of the amendment by 30 parties. There had to be a decision taken by two-thirds of the states after the beginning of 2017. So we haven't yet had uh, a triggering of this incipient jurisdiction, uh, but it may occur soon. Uh, the formulation adopted uh, by the Rome Conference had a number of significant restrictions on the exercise of jurisdiction by the International Court over the crime of aggression. Uh, for example, the court will only have jurisdiction over acts of aggression that occur more than one year after the ratification of these amendments. Uh, any state party may declare that it doesn't accept the jurisdiction. And with respect to non-parties, uh, the court will have no jurisdiction by alleged aggression by their nationals or in their territory. Furthermore, the prosecutor, before he institutes a case, has to ascertain whether the Security Council has made a decision about that particular instance. Uh, and if not, he has to wait six months, he or she, uh, until uh, the matter is put forward. And of course, the Security Council under the Rome Statute can always decide uh, to postpone uh, action by the tribunal in any case for periods of six months or more. The definition of the crime adopted in the Rome Statute was based on the definition earlier adopted by the General Assembly, uh, but it didn't really resolve any of the ambiguities that I referred to. Uh, for example, the question of anticipatory self-defense, the question of humanitarian intervention. It does add some additional limitations on the exercise of that jurisdiction by the court. Uh, for example, uh, it only covers aggression which by its character, gravity, or scale constitutes a manifest violation of the charter. Not sure what that means. It only applies to persons in a position effectively to exercise control over or direct the political or military action of a state, only high-level people. So these could be significant um, limitations in practice, we just don't know. So the bottom line is that now the International Criminal Court may have jurisdiction, assuming these procedural steps are taken, but it will be a limited jurisdiction with respect to aggression and we have to see yet what the practical impact of that may be. And that is the primary focus of our panel here today. Uh, they're going to be dealing with the policy, the security, the practical effects of the possibility of prosecution of aggression in the International Criminal Court. And so I'm going to turn it over to our eminent panelists, and I'm going to start with Secretary Sewell. Thank you so much, Mike, and thank you to the American Society of International Law for the opportunity to be here today with uh, this terrific group of panelists. Um, as Mike has noted, governments have spent a considerable amount of time hashing through many legal questions raised by the amendments on the crime of aggression that were ultimately adopted at the ICC's 2010 Review Conference in Kampala. And my purpose today is less to debate those questions than to offer a perspective on the policy implications of these amendments. Um, we in the US government are concerned about the potential of these amendments to have lasting of negative effects, and we believe that it's vital for states involved in this process to work together 
to avoid harming our common ability to prevent atrocities, resolve conflicts, and pursue justice for the worst global crimes. So let me start by underscoring that notwithstanding the very serious concerns that I'll express here today, I am not questioning the motives of our many friends and allies who have been uh, supportive of the Kampala amendments. Like them, we fully agree that aggression is inimical to a rules-based international order and to the cause of peace and security that we seek to advance through our efforts around the world every day. Moreover, Russia's attempt to annex Crimea, to choose just one recent example, serves as a reminder that the international community will continue to face an ongoing imperative to oppose aggression as a significant policy challenge. The question, however, is whether the Rome Statute amendments can be an effective and appropriate addition to the international community's toolbox. And here, as I will explain in greater detail, I think that the risks of the current amendments outweigh the benefits. And we'll continue to work to persuade our partners of this, but we also know that for some, opposing these amendments in toto may not be an option. And for this reason, we propose that other states think seriously about how they can mitigate some of the greatest risks that we see as inherent in the current amendments. Taking a step back, we recognize that this is a challenging issue, that many years of preparatory work informed the decisions made in Kampala, and that the review conference took steps aimed at addressing at least some of the concerns that were raised here, as Mike just mentioned. We welcomed, for example, the decision of the parties to exclude from the court's jurisdiction over aggression the nationals of countries that are not party to the Rome Statute. And we welcome the decision to defer until 2017 at the earliest any decision to activate that jurisdiction, which has provided breathing space and time in which important and still outstanding issues presented by these amendments could be addressed. But at this point, we are well into the fifth year of this seven-year period, and it is becoming ever more pressing that the international community make productive use of this reflection time. Many of our concerns and many of the means of mitigating them are linked to the uncertainty that still surrounds crucial aspects of the amendments and how they may be interpreted and applied. The definition of the crime itself, as adopted in Kampala, was ostensibly based on an earlier UN resolution that gave guidance to the Security Council on identifying acts of aggression, but the definition that the parties adopted stripped away the critical requirement that the assessment of a use of force, quote, must be considered in light of all the circumstances of each particular case, end quote. And it shifted the role of applying this guidance and making these judgments, which inevitably involve political judgments, from the Security Council to a judicial body that is meant to remain above politics. This makes the need for clarity all the greater. Some of the formal understandings that were adopted in Kampala helped at the margins to clarify which acts will and will not be covered, but there remains little clarity or consensus about the meaning of the core elements in the definition. Our concerns about uncertainty have been exacerbated by the efforts of some supporters of the amendments to promote an interpretation which we believe flies clearly in the face of the plain language of the Rome Statute, contending that the court's aggression jurisdiction would extend even to the nationals of states parties that do not ratify the amendments. Now, why do these open questions matter so much for those who work on peace or security or to promote international justice? Some degree of uncertainty may be inevitable when a text of this complexity is negotiated, but the questions I've referenced are at the heart of the fundamental policy choices that states supporting these amendments will need to make, and they therefore should be addressing these uncertainties squarely now. The alternative, simply trusting or hoping that the court itself will eventually figure it out when live cases involving actual defendants come before it, and only after a period of chilling uncertainty, this alternative seems risky and inappropriate given the magnitude of the associated issues. The activation of the court's aggression jurisdiction would be a highly consequential, even unprecedented intervention into the international security architecture. And if the ICC states parties proceed, they have an obligation to resolve the outstanding questions. I'd like to detail three specific concerns about the activation of the court's aggression jurisdiction. First, we're concerned that the activation could chill the willingness of states to cooperate in certain military action where the legal basis for that action might be contested, 
including action aimed at stopping the very kinds of outrages, including mass atrocities, that prompted the court's creation. President Obama has emphasized the importance of collective action by a broad range of allies and partners when we deal with these threats to humanity. But many of our allies and partners are parties to the Rome Statute, and it's easy to imagine the complications and the chilling effect that could arise in any number of situations involving ethnic cleansing or other atrocities where the imperative for action is overwhelming. Imagine, in such a situation after the court's aggression jurisdiction had been activated, the Prime Minister of a Rome Statute Party being told by her legal advisors that they could not guarantee or reliably advise that the court would not regard a decision to join or support a coalition as aggression. Given current uncertainties, the legal advisors might also advise that the ICC prosecutor could well undertake an investigation of the matter and even pursue criminal proceedings and an arrest warrant. The international community has grappled for decades with the challenges of mobilizing the will to prevent humanitarian catastrophes, and we fear that one of the effects of activating the ICC's aggression jurisdiction will be to create new potential obstacles to military action when it is urgently needed to save innocent lives. Second, we're concerned that the activation of the amendments may reduce the ability of the international community to manage and resolve conflicts. While the international community has strived for consensus around the principle that atrocities cannot legitimately be the subject of an amnesty, it is not obvious that the same approach is appropriate for the crime of aggression, which is of a fundamentally different character. Imagine two states in conflict, each having accused the other of starting the war, but prepared to make a peace. The United Nations has said that it will not endorse provisions in peace agreements that include amnesties for mass atrocities, but should the international community similarly insist that parties to a conflict not take off the table prosecution of the leaders of one side or another for resorting to force in a, quote, manner inconsistent with the Charter of the United Nations? Particularly with so little certainty about how the court will interpret the substance of the amendments, is the international community ready to insist that these are the crimes that must be prosecuted in every instance at any cost, that these are the crimes that cannot go unpunished. A third concern is that the activation of the aggression jurisdiction will harm the court's ability to carry out its core mission, deterring and punishing genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. Let me be clear, while the United States government has a complex relationship with the ICC, we have worked to promote the court's success in a wide range of contexts, and we have expressed our support for each of the situations in which ICC investigations and prosecutions are underway. But the ICC is still working to establish and sustain a record of effectiveness in the basic functions by which its success will be measured, such as apprehending defendants, protecting its witnesses, and prosecuting cases already underway. How will a court that is already struggling to fulfill its core mandate respond to the additional burden of the kind of decisions it would have to make under the Kampala Amendments. The assessments involved in prosecuting aggression will inevitably be deeply political. Which actor bears responsibility for a conflict? Who has acted legitimately in self-defense? The court would find itself in a role better suited for political actors, particularly if it seeks to prosecute a crime that lacks both a clear definition and the extensive jurisprudence that has developed around many atrocity crimes. While the United States is not a party to the Rome Statute and its nationals would be explicitly excluded from the ICC's aggression jurisdiction, we nonetheless have a deep interest in the outcome of the state's party's deliberations on this issue, as do all who share the responsibilities and bear the risks of combating atrocities and underwriting global security. And this brings me back to what I proposed at the beginning, which is that for states who entertain the possibility of supporting these amendments to the statute, we believe it's critical to focus on whether the risks that have been identified here can be sufficiently managed before taking the very consequential decision of whether to activate this new basis of jurisdiction. In this connection, let me offer at least some preliminary thoughts on some of the risk mitigation measures that could be considered. Governments and parliaments of states' parties could formally state their views on the questions raised here. They can clarify the scope of which acts are covered and confirm that the amendments do not apply to states' parties that do not ratify the amendments. They could do this, for example, in a statement at the upcoming sessions of the ICC's Assembly of States' Parties or in written instruments communicating their decisions whether or not to ratify. 
Perhaps most critically, if there were eventually a decision by the Assembly of States parties to activate the amendments, states could insist that the decision contain clear guidance on these issues. States parties could also clarify how the opt-out provisions contained in the amendments might be used to help address the concerns raised here and serve as a guardrail or check on an overly broad application of the amendments. And finally, states parties could also consider other steps, including the possibility of adopting further understandings to ensure these amendments do not work at cross purposes to the critical goal of preventing atrocity crimes. To be sure, the activation of the court's jurisdiction over aggression is not a step that the United States has sought. Still, I trust that we can continue this international dialogue in a spirit of good faith and with the urgency that it deserves. We look forward to working with other countries and members of civil society to help ensure full consideration of the risks described here and mitigation measures such as those that have been sketched out. And I very much appreciate the opportunity to engage in this discussion in that regard. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now may I turn it over to Ms. Hansen. Yes. Um, first of all, let me thank you for the opportunity to talk here today in this um, distinguished panel. I will try to give you a European perspective on the crime of aggression um, from the viewpoint of Denmark, um, a relatively minor European country. <laughs> First of all, I have to underline that I'm speaking in my personal capacity. The views that I present uh, are mine and do not necessarily represent the views of uh, the Danish government. Furthermore, I should stress that although I'm speaking about the European perspective uh, on the crime of aggression, I'm obviously not speaking on behalf of the Europeans who, as this audience knows, in many respects is a very diverse group of countries, um, also when it comes to ratifying the definition of aggression. Let me start by underlining the importance of the ICC in general. Um, the prominence of the ICC is not to be underestimated. Um, Denmark, as a founding member, full-heartedly supports the court and its achievements to promote global justice. The creation of the ICC is one of the most, if not the most, important development in the history of international criminal law. The court has, in relatively short time, been able to investigate and carry out important cases. Among European uh, or EU governments, this is not a common formalized position on the issue of ratification of the Kampala Amendments. However, there's no doubt that the strong support for the ICC is shared by all EU states. There's an elaborate and highly focused common EU position on the promotion of the ICC and the protection of the integrity of the Rome Statute. And there's also tradition for accepting to lay out important decisions to international courts in Europe, such as the European Court of Human Rights and the EU Court. This should be borne in mind um, as an overall consideration when considering the European perspective on the crime of aggression. Let me continue by saying a few words about Danish thinking on the issue. Uh, Denmark obviously joined the consensus on the Kampala Conference in 2010 in adopting their proposed rules. Since then, we have, of course, been keeping track of the growing number of ratifications among EU governments, and we're closely following these developments. We have given some initial thought to the issue of ratification, but I should stress that the Danish government at the moment has no formal position on ratification on the crime of aggression. On one hand, we support that the ICC should be able to judge cases concerning what have been called the supreme international crime. That was decided already in Rome in 98. On the other hand, it's true that activating the ICC's jurisdiction on aggression raises some important questions, not only on the precise interpretation of the provisions, but also on how concrete cases will play out in the context of efforts to maintain international peace and security, or as this panel puts it, how it will affect the international security architecture. Denmark hasn't concluded this analysis. We want to make sure to draw our conclusion on the best possible foundation. Obviously, we'll reach a decision in due time. Maybe I should add that in our view, Danish consent is required for the aggression provision to come into force for Denmark. To put it in another way, we do think that the statute's Article 121, Paragraph 5, should apply and that no state can be bound by the amendments without ratification. So the key issue we have to consider is whether ICC jurisdiction regarding regression will have a certain chilling effect when it comes to use of force. First of all, I'd like to stress 
that this whole debate stresses the importance for states to be transparent regarding the legal foundation for any use of force. In every democratic society, it's important for the government to put forward and speak publicly, publicly about the legal foundation they have based the decision on the use of force upon. And we have to concede that the use of force rules are often subject to varying interpretations. In fact, it's difficult to think of recent instances of use of force between states where one or more of the parties did not contest the legality. <clears throat> Disagreements regarding the analysis and conclusions are unavoidable, but if the analysis will remain in closed circles and not in the public debate, it will most likely cause controversy and lack of acceptance. At this, at this point, we should probably distinguish between desired and undesired chilling effects, or positive and negative chilling effects. For me, a chilling effect that discourages illegal use of force is desired and positive. Deterrence was and is one of the main objectives underlying the Rome Statute. So when the ICC takes control of a new crime, one should think that its de deterrence would grow. However, it's important to note that at least in our view, ICC jurisdiction over the crime of aggression will be limited to those actually ratifying the crime of aggression amendment. Moreover, non-state parties to the ICC statute will remain outside the court's jurisdiction. In other words, the positive chilling effect could be limited due to the lack of ratifications. Chilling effects that stop countries from joining coalitions that use force within the boundaries of international law to promote international peace and security are, on the other hand, desirable. Undes not desirable, sorry, <laughs> and are negative. But will the risk of prosecutions affect political and, in some countries, military leaders? This probably cannot be denied and will likely be taken into consideration by the actual decision makers. However, from a European perspective, it's probably important to note that compliance of military operations with international law is already key. I can't speak as to inner workings of other countries, but I believe and hope that it is inconceivable that any Danish government would resort to force if it would be contrary to international law advice by, for instance, government lawyers. Obviously, our threshold is already the UN Charter 2-4 for taking action. The crime of aggression threshold is use of force, which by its character, gravity, and scale constitutes a manifest violation of international law. Understandings of crime of, of aggression adopted at Kampala further underscore the significance of this threshold. It is obviously open for debate, what the exact meaning uh, of aggression should be given here and what meaning ICC will give the crime. But see, from the perspective of many Europeans, it's not a plausible scenario at all that the ICC will not take, that the ICC will take unreasonable positions. Also because the Kampala amendments entail additional elements to preclude frivolous prosecutions. So thinking forward and concluding, it seems likely that EU states will ultimately use um, a fear of unjustable, um, it seems unlikely that EU states will ultimately use a fear of un unjustifiable ICC prosecution as a reason not to use force in a situation where it's otherwise considered justified. A final point on a potential chilling effect is that when ratifying many countries, also Denmark, uh, should it be the case, will probably enact domestic legislation criminalizing aggression. This means that leaders also run the risk of domestic prosecution, which also could have a chilling effect. Careful preparation of relevant national legislation is therefore essential. Again, legal advice, assumedly, will be key for political and military leaders. The extent and character of this legal advice can be crucial when assess assessing possible responsibilities. This, by the way, also raises uh, interesting questions of intent. Based of, on which intent is, is use of force carried out in specific cases, and what implications will it have if two states use force in the same coalition, but each based on different legal grounds? As we speak, 23 countries have ratified the amendments regarding crime of aggression. Of these 23 countries are 18 European states. Quite a few of the remaining European countries are at an advanced stage of their domestic ratification procedure and will most likely ratify before 2017. 
However, a relatively large group of European countries remain undecided. We see a pattern towards regional ratification. The smaller countries started the process, and now some larger countries are also ready to ratify. I will not here today start categorizing which of these EU countries are most likely, based on historical and political experience, to join coalitions in order to uphold the international security architecture. Before I stop, I would like to highlight one particular issue of relevance also for Denmark. That is the area of humanitarian intervention, where international law is not clear. In my view, the crime of aggression and the court's interpretation of it needs to go hand in hand with the principles of humanitarian intervention. Denmark believes that under certain exceptional circumstances where no other option is available, the use of force without Security Council authorization in order to protect large numbers of civilians against mass atrocities may in certain exceptional cases not be unlawful under international law. Few countries, however, publicly share that view, at least not yet. This could become an issue under any consideration of ratification in Denmark. Of course, we can find some assurance in the definition of the crime of aggression, more specifically, its reference to the character of a military operation. But as noted, we believe that under such limited conditions, humanitarian intervention would not, be, would not only not be a crime of aggression, but also not be a violation of the UN Charter. We see ratification of the crime of aggression more broadly as an opportunity for state parties to reiterate that humanitarian intervention, humanitarian intervention narrowly construed is not illegal under international law. With these remarks, I'd like to conclude by once again thanking the organizers for bringing this panel together. The issues before us are highly complex and important and deserve thorough consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ambassador Volker. Thank you, and uh, thanks to um, the great Todd Buchwald for inviting me to be here, and to you, Mike, for moderating. And uh, I want to first off say uh, I want to speak strictly as a practitioner here. I'm not here to, to lawyer things out or to argue some of the lawyerly merits of this, but just to say, practically speaking, what would I expect if these amendments were to go into place? And in that respect, I want to endorse everything that Undersecretary Sewell said. Um, quite um, very, very measured, very diplomatically put, but I think very, very well said as well too. The uh, way I'd like to go about this is first off, look at what do we see with the ICC as it is. Second, how would changing uh, changing it to include crime of aggression um, change the decision making of actors? And then three, what are some of the uh, possible other consequences that we should worry about? First off, uh, I like having the ICC around. Uh, so let's be clear about that. Uh, I think having an organization that is charged with uh, monitoring and prosecuting crimes against humanity, genocide, that's a good institution to have around. I think we need to be careful about our expectations of it and how it works, but I'd rather have it than not have it. Well, I say that because if you think about the last period of time since the Rome Statutes were put into effect, since they took effect, there hasn't been any diminution in her war crimes and crimes against humanity and heinous activities. Um, look at Syria, look at Libya, uh, look at uh, all sorts of countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, it hasn't changed much. In fact, you could argue that uh, in some respects, maybe the decisions that it compelled on people were actually not helpful. In past eras, we had dictators who did terrible things, and we managed to hold our nose and find them in exile and get them out of a country so that the killing stopped, the abuses stopped. Yes, they lived an unfair, wealthy life on the French Riviera or something, but the country got on with its life. And I think you could argue that, say, for instance, in the case of Libya with Muammar Gaddafi, uh, he probably looked around, saw what happened uh, in Tunisia, the country fell apart, saw that he was going to be indicted uh, for war crimes, probably brought before the ICC, and said, you know what, I'm going to fight to the death here. I'm, I'm going to hang on. Certainly, uh, Bashar Assad has not uh, been concerned about the prospect of him going before the ICC and, and look at what he has done inside Syria. 
So I'm not sure that um, it has had a deterrent effect on the kind of crimes that we would hope we would have a deterrent effect on. It may have reinforced some bad decision making. That being said, having it out there as a tool to be exercised at the right time, at the end of a conflict, when we are stabilizing a situation, I think it is a useful tool to have. So with that in mind, the second point then is, well, if that's what we know about the ICC as it is, if we were to add crime of aggression to one of the things that the ICC would be responsible for, how would that affect the decision making of actors in the world today? And for the sake of simplicity, let's say there are two kinds of actors. There's bad actors and good actors. Um, bad actors are motivated principally by whatever it is that is causing them to be a bad actor. Um, it is their, their neighbor, their wealth, their power, their, um, their identity, might be religious, whatever it is, that's what's important to them. And that is going to be more important to them than the risk of facing the ICC. Because if they win and they're successful, they'll protect themselves and things will move on over time. Uh, just to give you uh, an illustration of a totally different nature, but from my time at NATO, people would always complain about how NATO and the EU could never work together, that it was just impossible. And, and one of my predecessors, Bob Hunter, referred to them as two organizations in the same city on different planets. And that is largely true. But why is that? That's because Cyprus is a member of the EU, Turkey is a member of NATO, each of them have an uh, issue with the other about control of northern Cyprus, whether Turkey sees it as an independent state or Cyprus sees it as Turkish occupied. And neither one of them is going to go along with the other country being taken seriously and, and respected in its organization, whether it's NATO or the EU. So they block all NATO-EU cooperation. Now everybody pulls their hair out and says, isn't this terrible that an island of 500,000 people is determining the fate of a half a billion people? But the fact is, this issue of Cyprus is more important to either one of those two countries than the fact of NATO-EU cooperation is to either one of them. And it's just never going to get fixed that way. And so that's the kind of the thinking process that's going to go on with a bad actor. Uh, it, it's just not going to be a deterrent. On the other hand, and the uh, Undersecretary Sewell alluded to this, there are good actors out there. And how is it going to be, uh, how is this in inclusion of aggression going to affect the decision making of good actors? Well, as, as she pointed out, uh, for uh, coalition partners, maybe not for the United States per se, but for coalition partners, it's going to increase the risk of being a coalition partner. Saying, well, if I get involved in something, and you know, it's not self-defense, but it is intervening, maybe for humanitarian purposes, maybe it's to stop the killing in Libya, or prevent the atrocity uh, of people marching on Benghazi, or maybe it's uh, if we were to have done something about Syria, or prevent Russia from annexing uh, Crimea, well, maybe that would be considered aggression because it's not in my territory. Do I really want to take on that additional burden? So it could be a little bit of a deterrent against the good actors rather than a deterrent against the bad actors. Then the final thing, that, I, and I would add too, aggression, as, as Mike mentioned in his introduction, is already illegal. Uh, so you're not adding a new element of illegality. It's already there. It just the fact that it is illegal has not stopped aggression. And I don't think putting it into the ICC is going to stop aggression either. The, the final thing I would say then, so what are the consequences beyond this? Um, one of the things that I just take on as a practitioner without, you know, any, <laughs> any, any comment as to, to how fair or unfair it is, it's just a fact of life, is that there will be groups, organizations, countries that will use a cause like this and, a, and an entity like this to drag the U.S. out in front, to, dry, to drag Israel out in front of it, and to change the focus from what it is meant to be on, which is a bad actor committing aggression against another, to being about complaining about U.S. policies or Israeli policies or other good actor policies, getting ourselves tied up in that. And I, I remember 
before I went to NATO, we had issues of whether Secretary Rumsfeld was ever going to go to a NATO, another NATO defense minister's meeting because he was under indictment in Belgium under a universality clause where some NGO had decided that they thought the US intervention in Iraq was illegal and therefore brought it up in a Belgian court and the courts just did their thing. And he just said, as long as this is standing in a legal procedure in Belgium, I'm not going to any more NATO meetings. <laughs> and it took a lot of uh, diplomatic and some legal work to unwind that. Uh, you see this with UN Security Council debates over Israeli policies. You see it with the UN um, Commission on Human Rights and the cases that they choose to bring up in the Human Rights Commission. So I think there is a high risk of politicization of the ICC and of this clause rather than uh, using it for its intended purpose. And then the final point then is, well, that also brings about another consequence, which is a diminution in the credibility of the ICC. It takes away from what I think is its high purpose of dealing with war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and embroiling it more into political dispute that is going to be controversial and diminish the court in the eyes of a lot of others. So for a whole variety of reasons, I'm, I'm agreeing with the conclusions that Under Secretary Sewell had, but maybe putting them a little bit more bluntly if just from the perspective of how I could see it playing out. Thank you very much. Mr. Halpern. Well, the problem of going last, especially in a panel which doesn't have as wide a range of views on this subject as there is in the world, is that almost everything has been said. Uh, so let me just try to underline a few of, uh, I think, the most important points that have been that had been made about this. First of all, I come at this as somebody deeply committed to the International Criminal Court. I believe it has already had a very substantial impact. And it's an impact that's hard to measure. But if you look, for example, at African political leaders deciding whether to overturn the results of elections in which they lost, I think it is clear that there are several cases in which the fear of an ICC uh, indictment, and of course there have been two coming out of African elections, has played and I think will continue to play an increasingly important role in that process. I think it is the case that it has had an impact on the settlements of disputes, but in my view, a favorable one. That is, people have learned that they can't simply get uh, amnesty on the table by just saying, well, I'll think about leaving after I've done the most horrendous things uh, and get that. And I think that's good. And I think the evidence that it detracts from the settlement of these disputes uh, is simply very hard to find and that uh, more often it is the case people are careful about what they do uh, because of the impact of the, on the on their own possibility of being indicted. Uh, but the court, as we all know, is still in a very difficult and precarious situation and will be uh, for a very long time. It has had trouble, as we know, uh, in arresting and bringing to the court a number of people who have been indicted, including some heads of state. It has trouble providing protection for witnesses and it seems some important cases dissolve because witnesses have not been protected. And it has now had thrust upon it uh, the Palestine issue, which I think, however it deals with it, cannot hurt but to complicate uh, the position of the court and in many people's eyes further politicize it uh, whichever direction the prosecutor decides to go uh, on this issue. So I think in considering whether to add to the burdens of the court, uh, one needs to come at it in my view with the notion that this is a very important but very fragile institution uh, one with very severe growing pains. And if you look at it from that perspective, I don't think it's at all a close question. Uh, and I think that the, uh, the commitment to doing this uh, comes out of deeply rooted uh, and strong values and concerns, but I think it is misplaced. First of all, if you look at the compromises that were made in Kampala to get this adopted, they take most of the teeth out of the jurisdiction. Countries that are likely to engage in actions which are aggression and manifestly violate the Charter of the United Nations 
are in almost all cases not members of the court, and any who are far members of the court will simply not ratify uh, this position. And I think any fair reading of what was adopted says that if you are not a member of the court or you do not accept this provision, uh, your nationals cannot be prosecuted for acts of aggression. Uh, and so it's hard to, having had to make that compromise, it's hard for me to understand why the decision then wasn't, let's put this off for 15 years until maybe we can avoid making this compromise, rather than going ahead uh, with what I think is inevitably an empty shell. But an empty shell that will nevertheless, I think, further complicate the life of the court. Because as we all know, what is aggression uh, is inherently political. It inherently depends on one's assessment of whether there was a reasonable fear that the other side was about to attack, whether you were dealing with other evolving notions of when use of force is acceptable, even if you haven't already been attacked. Um, and that inevitably the court will be confronted with a difficult political choice. Now, if the drafters had decided to limit this to referrals from the Security Council, then in my view it would make much more sense and would be much less political. The Security Council is charged by the Charter with the primary responsibility for dealing with acts of aggression. And it could well reach the judgment uh, that a referral of a case to the International Criminal Court where it had found an act of aggression and where it was taking steps to, to undo the aggression, that this additional element would be, in fact, useful. And therefore, I think it would make sense for the court to add the act of aggression, but only when it is referred by the Security Council. Because inevitably, if the court is asked to act on a claim of aggression, uh, where there is not a referral by the Security Council, it will be in the middle of a political milestorm. It will be in the middle, almost certainly, of a situation where there's been a veto at the Security Council, uh, where there are fundamentally different views among uh, world powers about whether this is aggression or not, and in which it is hard to argue that that decision is, quote, a legal one, uh, that a court which is struggling to establish its credibility and effectiveness uh, should be asked to make. It is also, I think, manifestly clear that if it made a decision in such a case, uh, it would not be able to execute it. It is hard to imagine a leader of a country that commits aggression able to avoid a Security Council resolution declaring it aggression and still be arrested and brought before uh, the international court. So we're simply adding to the list of people who will be indicted uh, amidst political controversy but not uh, brought to justice. And finally, I want to say a word about humanitarian intervention. I'm surprised we've gotten this far without Kosovo being mentioned because in my view, uh, it is the most important lesson and model to look at for this area. I happen to have been in the State Department. I was deeply involved in the American decision uh, that we needed to stop uh, the Serbian aggression uh, on Kosovo uh, and to interfere to prevent the humanitarian disaster. I think it was the right decision. It was extraordinarily difficult to persuade other European of European countries, other NATO countries, to participate in that. They were all being told, as the State Department legal advisors were telling the policymakers, that the best they could say was that uh, they were not able to say that it was illegal, but they were also not able to say that it was legal. And of course, we did not have the added element of, can you assure me that I will not be indicted? Uh, now, we can all say, that it is hard to imagine a humanitarian intervention which is manifestly a violation of the Charter. But I think we all know that it is also extremely difficult to get lawyers to say, I will guarantee you that you will not be indicted uh, if you take this step. They simply will not do that. They cannot do that because while they may think the indictment is implausible or inappropriate, uh, they're not the prosecutors whose views they're trying to judge. And I think it is impossible to say 
that the adoption of this provision will not make it exceedingly less likely that countries that do ratify this provision are less likely to participate in humanitarian in interventions. And if you believe, as I do, that it is important to maintain the option of military action to prevent humanitarian disasters, and if you believe, as you must if you look at the world, that it is very hard to find countries open to participating in such interventions, an act which will reduce that number, perhaps by a significant amount, is, in my view, clearly not a step that promotes international justice. Thank you. Thank you very much for these excellent interventions. And of course, when Mort refers to the State Department lawyers who were unable to assure their clients that it was clear that international law would allow the Kosovo operation, he's referring to me. <laughs> At any rate. <laughs> so in a moment, I'm going to open up the floor to questions and comments from all of you. Uh, and let me just uh, ask three practical questions about this, which uh, you may want to refer to, or you may want to refer to, and some of them have been mentioned, I think, in the interventions up to now. Uh, the first question is, what states are likely to be the objects of investigation and prosecution for this crime if uh, the International Criminal Court does uh, exercise uh, its jurisdiction over aggression? Uh, Non-party states are exempted, which means presumably some of the great powers, the United States, uh, Russia, China, India, will not be uh, subject to criminal prosecution. Uh, most of the states of the Middle East where these conflicts and atrocities are going on were not parties. Uh, so uh, the African states may or may not get aboard, since there are many African states now that have political difficulties with the court. Does this mean in practice that uh, indictments are likely to be only against uh, Western European states, uh, e.g. Kosovo. Second question, what is the likely effect of uh, this new crime of aggression being prosecuted by the ICC on possible future ratifications? Clearly, uh, a large part of the viability of the court in the future will depend upon whether it can attract ratifications by states like the Great Powers, states like Middle East Powers, states like South Asian Powers, where all these conflicts are likely to occur. Uh, what effect will this new crime of aggression have upon the likelihood of those ratifications? Third question is, what effect is this new uh, form of jurisdiction likely to have on the viability and effectiveness of the court itself? The court is obviously having great difficulties now in uh, accomplishing effective prosecutions, Kenya uh, is one example, Sudan another, Libya is a third. Uh, will the court be more successful with respect to prosecutions for aggression? Uh, and if not, what is that going to mean for the future of the court? I throw those out for anybody who wants to answer them, but at any rate, uh, anybody on the panel want to? Yeah, okay, fine. So now we're going to go to the audience. And I would invite you to ask your questions, and I may group them together for the purpose of response. We, first of all, we have an extremely eminent voice from the history of this uh, entire enterprise. Please identify yourself and your affiliation. My name is Ben Ferenz. I'm the sole surviving Nuremberg war crimes prosecutor. And uh, at the United Nations, some of my friends called me Mr. Aggression because I'd written more books on that subject and more articles and more speeches and, than any other dead or alive human being. I want to congratulate the members of the panel for being so thorough in their reading of all of the possible objections to uh, the ICC dealing with the crime of aggression, which Justice Robert Jackson, whom I much admired, and the court held to be the supreme international crime and which was approved also by the General Assembly of the United Nations and mostly hailed by many nations of the world, particularly those who are not so powerful as to pose a threat of committing aggression against their neighbors. That's by way of introduction. Uh, I understand the positions raised. I've heard all of the complaints. I'm a believer in the rule of law. I'm also a believer that the United States is a great democracy, and it's inevitable, and, and as it should be, that there will be differences of opinion, and there will be many people, particularly those in power, who believe, as 
has been believed for centuries, that power is what really counts, and uh, the rest of it is just talk. So uh, I admire the frankness with which uh, you have listed all of the possible objections, and surely many of the objections I agree with. The ICC, International Criminal Court, is a prototype, and uh, they're just beginning, just as the first computer would occupy most of this room, but now you carry it in your pocket. So it will be, if you believe in the rule of law, as I do, then you must find some way to try to stop this horrible thing called war. I was a combat soldier in World War II. I was awarded five battle stars for not being killed in any of the major battles. I prosecuted mass murderers. I understood their mentality. I heard their arguments. They were not wild animals. These were ed educated uh, patriots for their own country. I have seen that war makes murderers out of people who are otherwise normal human beings. And I've come away with a determination that what has been glorified for centuries as heroic and necessary for the strength and prestige and power of a nation is really a very horrible thing. It's a point of view which not was invented by this poor immigrant boy from Transylvania. It was espoused by a much admired President Eisenhower in his speeches in which he said very specifically that the world can no longer rely on force. It must turn to the rule of law or it will end all civilization. And yet you point to all these difficulties and in an effort to help you and others who have the same view, I have raised a new theory. Let's not call it aggression. Because if aggression is so difficult to define that it hasn't been defined in the last 70 years, which of course is certainly not true, it could be defined, but you don't want to say you just don't want to be subject to trial. Uh, then let's call the baby something else, which is more acceptable. Why about calling the following acts? The illegal use of armed force. By illegal, I mean it's not in self-defense and it's not been approved by the Security Council, knowing that it will inevitably kill large numbers of innocent civilians, is a crime for which the individual who is responsible, and Nuremberg held that crime is committed by individuals, for which the individual responsible will have to be held to account in a competent court of some kind to explain his behavior. But let's not call it aggression because it's too difficult. It's too loaded with political things and commitments and definitions and manifest violations of this and that and that. Let's call it what it is, a crime against humanity. Now, crimes against humanity, everybody, I think, would agree, should be diminished to the extent possible. We're never going to stop either people killing each other, since Cain slew his brother Abel, but we may be able to deter it by letting it be known that those responsible will be held to criminal account. If you don't believe that criminal law is, has any deterrent effect, then you are on the side of the mafia. Uh, what you have to recognize is that the best you can do is try to frighten some of the people into believing and knowing that they personally will be held to account when they do what they do now. They send lots of young people, like some of you on the panel, everybody's young compared to me, send young people out to kill other young people they don't even know, who have never done them any harm, may never have done harm to anyone. And you kill as many of them as you can, and they kill as many as you if you can, and when you get tired of killing each other, you go home and declare victory, and you wait a while, and then you start again. That's the present system. You're lawyers, you're lawyers. This is the American Society of International Law. You don't have to sit here and say whatever you propose is too complicated, it's too difficult, you can't interpret it, you have to look at it this way, that way. Stop it! And one way to stop it to some extent is to say those who are responsible will answer in a court of law. You want to set up the court of law? Fine, fine. The United States can do what it wishes. If you don't want to have, have a court of law, you don't have it. You got what you got instead. You think it's nice? 
The war is changing. I've seen war in its horrors, but that's nothing to what still awaits the store on cyber, from cyberspace. You won't hear it, you won't see it. You'll just wake up dead. Uh, so you have to have new thinking. You have to recognize that law has a role to play. This is the American Society of International Law. Its founder had in the Harvard Law School a description which I have been bound by. Make us effective for the cause of peace and justice and liberty in the world. Law is the medium for doing that. It has its problems, don't destroy it. If the name aggression offends you, call it a crime against humanity. Uh, find something in the existing statutes which makes it possible to deter that particular crime, which I do believe is the supreme international crime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Let's take one more question, then we'll ask the panel to respond. Thank you. Good afternoon. Ana Cristina Rodriguez. I'm legal advisor from the Permanent Mission of Guatemala to the UN. And uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank the panelists and also fully endorse uh, the comments just made by Ben Ferenc. Um, I found some of the, the remarks a bit alarmist. And I seem to recall that in the days following the Kampala conference, both there was a, a joint press conference held by uh, Harold Cole and Stephen Rapp, uh, in which they stated that the outcome protected our vital interests. And um, the truth is that in prosecuting aggression, because this is not a crime that is done in a vacuum, you ensure the prosecution of other crimes of the Rome Statute. And I find it very important not only to complete the original um, Rome Statute as, uh, um, as drafted, I'm sorry, originally, but also to, um, in the deterrent effect, protect small states from aggressor states. And the truth is that all small states have is international law. And also to protect soldiers from illegal war making and finally, I would just say that it's not about bad actors or good actors, but if good actors do bad things, they should be punished. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody in the panel like to uh, comment? I would like to, and I, I want to th uh, first thank you. Thank you for your comments and for your service as well, too. <laughs> no, but I do, because I think um, the rule of law depends upon the application of force. Because you can't apply the law unless there is an enforcement power to do so, whether it's the police in a state or in some other thing. In the international system, we do not have the capacity to implement universally in the enforcement of law that's out there with an authority that enjoys legitimacy of the entire world. No one would accept if we were unilaterally to say the United States will be the enforcement power. We will decide and, and we will enforce. No one is going to go along with that. Neither would we be comfortable if anybody else had that ability. So I fully agree there is tremendous scope for the use of law in the form of reaching agreements and trying to hold each other to them, but ultimately it comes down to the application of force in order to police the system. And in the case of aggression, as we were talking about, I, I don't believe it would be effective to have the International Criminal Court somehow charged with overseeing anti-aggression, lack of aggression, without any kind of enforcement power where, to go back to the terminology of good actors and bad actors, whoever they may be, um, bad actors will be motivated by what they're motivated by. Good actors will be, in, you know, even if they want to intervene for a rational purpose, they may be intimidated from doing so. And then there will be the political use of this court uh, for a variety of purposes. I'm not saying that there's no place for this discussion and for the law and for the court. In fact, I, I like the idea of having the court there, but I do think that without an enforcement mechanism, such as you have in a domestic system, you can't apply it the same way. Uh, 
First, I want to say, Ben, it was only because I saw you in the audience and the respect that I had for you that I pulled my punches about what I really thought about ed editing the act of, uh, of aggression. Um, I think the U.S. government did say, and Harold Coe is at the microphone so he can speak for himself, that um, it protected vital U.S. interests. But as I said in my remarks, it protected U.S. vital interests by taking the guts out of the uh, out of the crime. So you got all the bad aspects of it and none of the good aspects of it. Uh, because the countries uh, that might commit aggression are, are not uh, going to be covered. And I think the impetus was, as the other questioner said, to so complete the Rome Statute as it was originally intended. But I think that can be done, if it has to be done, by making aggression a crime, but only in the case of a referral from the Security Council, which I do not think makes sense for the other crimes, but I do think makes sense for the act of aggression, and it's the only situation in which there would be any chance to enforce it. So it would give the court jurisdiction where it could exercise that jurisdiction. It would have the, the crime of aggression covered by the statute, but not in a way that gets all of the bad consequences and none of the good consequences. All right, Secretary Sewell, and then Harold Coe. Uh, very briefly, just to build on Mort's point, I think that it, and we probably will hear uh, shortly from Harold Coe, uh, in terms of protecting American uh, n security interests, the, the fact of exclusion from non-states parties is certainly critical. But I want to make an important point about why the United States still cares, given the disposition of the debate such that there is clarity that the United States itself will not be subject to the jurisdiction of the court. And the reason why, and this is the reason so many Americans are proud of their country, is that the United States very much cares about the security of the entire globe. And so the United States wants to be able to preserve the ability of coalitions to do such things as act on behalf of uh, those who are subject to slaughter. Um, but whose protection could be contested as a matter of international law were states to intervene. And so I just think that's a very important point to make about why the United States takes the position that I've described today. Harold. Um, <clears throat> Harold Coe, Yale Law School. Um, at the press conference that was referred, our main concern, frankly, wasn't um, protecting vital U.S. national interests, although that was a concern. It was promoting a good rule of international law that's consistent with human rights. And part of the concern is that in a world in which we have Rwandas, as well as Kosovo's, do we want to deter collective action to prevent uh, gross violations, or do we want to leave the world only to post hoc prosecution of a very small number after the gross violations have occurred. Um, the main point of the press conference was we reached a solution in 2010 and we had seven years to solve it. Now it's 2015, so we have two years to solve it. And I think at this point, the most constructive approach for everybody here at the American Society of International Law is to focus on the last part of Sarah Sewell's presentation, which is, Kampala, we have a problem, what is the solution? And a solution that has been framed as some sort of collective uh, opt-out process or collective um, carve-out for humanitarian intervention of the Kosovo kind. Uh, the problem is that a second key aspect of Kampala was confusion about exactly whether it was an opt-out or an opt-in process. And because of the nature of the uh, urgent driving out the important, we're at 2015, and there's very, very little focus on this attention. The good thing about this panel is it starts that conversation. Um, it's being discussed also in, starting to, in uh, law review articles, for example. Uh, there's a good article in the Virginia Journal of International Law. Todd Buckwald and I have one coming out in the American Journal of International Law shortly, reviewing uh, some of the main issues. But where there does need to be collective attention now among all those who want the court to succeed, as Mort, I think, very eloquently put it, is what is a solution that people can agree upon that 
preserve space for preventing future Rwandas. Uh, thank you. Yes, please. Uh, my name is Don Ferenz, and uh, occasionally people ask me if I'm related to Ben Ferenz. My mother has assured me the answer to that is yes. Um, <laughs> we've heard today uh, much of the story, and I've appreciated very much the remarks of the panelists. Um, we know that unless there is a Security Council referral, no nationals of non-member states can be covered. And we know that if there is anything short of a Security Council referral, every member state has the option to opt out affirmatively of the court's jurisdiction. Obviously, some nation states would like to go on record as saying to the rest of the world that they would like to see the application of the rule of law with respect to the crime of aggression. With respect to those that don't share that view, since they're not covered unless there is a Security Council referral, and since if they are member states, they can opt out, I'm trying to understand what is the problem. I'd like somebody to address that since it's as porous as it is with respect to those that don't want to be bound. Would anybody in the panel like to address either of the last two interventions? Yeah, I think it's very simple. There are good, well-meaning European states who will not, if, if the decision is made that you have to opt out rather than opt in, who will not want to opt out of a provision that would hold them accountable if they committed aggression, but in a moment of truth in a Rwanda situation, may be told by their lawyers, uh, even though you know this is the right thing to do, the prosecutor uh, sitting in The Hague might indict you, and that would make it less likely that they would intervene. So I don't think that's an implausible situation at all. You wanted to respond? Well, I'd just like to ask, uh, considering the United States uh, has issued a report just in the last six months, the Senate uh, report on torture, and Everybody named in it uh, has immunity by the U.S. government in violation of various international treaties like under Geneva where we're supposed to hold our own citizens accountable for war crimes. Uh, and furthermore, we routinely have the United States government say of the people who uh, have been brought to lawsuits uh, accused of torture that they've only done it, U.S. officials have done it in the scope, within the scope of their uh, employment. Why should any uh, positive, and why should we talk about good actors and bad actors when we're showing ourselves to be the good actors committing crimes? And so perhaps we should look at our motives in, in arguing for this. Are we just trying to protect ourselves because we have aggressive wars planned in the future like John McCain regularly comes out promoting? Uh, so I think our motives should be suspect here. Any other comments from the... Audience, let me just ask the panelists, does anyone have any suggestions in response to Harold Coe's question, which is, is there any fix or any measures that could be taken to deal with the problems that you see between now and the possible entry into force of this in 2017? One easy fix with respect to this, what I consider to be red herring, this pointing to Article 121.5 and saying that countries haven't ratified, that is, member states haven't ratified, there's a question of whether they can be forced to opt out. One simple solution is have them all ratify, and then the issue goes completely away. An interesting but probably not practical suggestion. <laughs> Mike. I just want to address one point that you know, it gets uh, to the other Mr. Ferenc's question about what the concern is. Again, not looking at this as a lawyer, I accept that the provisions say that the U.S. cannot be sort of brought up in front of this because we're not a party. But seeing the way the world works politically, I'm not convinced that that will always be the case or even respected as it is, that things have a way of getting brought up in, in bank shots or attacks on the U.S. that and as a way, are we protecting ourselves? Yes, we're protecting ourselves. Um, in cases where we're in the wrong, we should come out that we're in the wrong, and um, I think that's important, but at the same time, there are plenty of cases where we're not, uh, such as you brought up uh, Kosovo, Mort, and you know, I, we had, when I was working for the Secretary General of NATO, we had the ICTY open an investigation of NATO. 
for whether we had committed war crimes in the conduct of the air campaign in Yugoslavia. And uh, it was eventually dropped, but it took a lot of distraction and effort. We got a lot of bad publicity for NATO out of that from what otherwise was a good humanitarian intervention. Uh, it's just that's the way things have a way of working out politically. You have one more? <laughs> yes, uh, Dave Sheffer at Northwestern Law. Um, I just wanted to introduce a couple of historical realities and then a perspective point. Um, everything that was said here today was extremely rational and logical. And an enormous number of those points were actually raised during the 1990s when we were negotiating the Rome Statute. And it's one of the reasons why in July 1998 we reached gridlock on activating the crime of aggression because so many of those concerns were left unanswered in the negotiations. I think that um, when we finally came to the Kampala Conference, the U.S. delegation led by uh, uh, Harold Coe and Steve Rapp did a tremendous job in making as much headway as they could to provide a sense of realism to the exercise. They were handicapped, and they noted this at Kampala, by the fact that we had not been in the room for eight years during the George W. Bush administration. So, so, so many of these very important arguments were simply not being put on the table for eight years in order to provide a, a sort of a more reasonable construct for the crime of aggression, particularly the issues of self-defense, humanitarian intervention, the introduction of responsibility to protect, what does that mean, et cetera. I would take Harold's cue, as well as our Danish colleagues' view, that um, there is something, and Don, that there is something that can be done with 121.5, whereby a state such as Denmark, rather than having to go through this excruciating opt-out exercise, which has its political implications, simply be able to say that we stand for our rights under Article 121.5, period, which means that you would have to actually ratify the amendment in order to be covered by it as opposed to entering the Kampala Amendment and then having to opt out within a year once you have ratified. There's a lot coming out. Harold mentioned his article with Todd. The commentary on the crime of aggression that um, uh, is being uh, uh, edited by Klaus Kress and Stefan Bariga is coming out soon. A lot of us have chapters in it. And in my chapter, I try to present a format whereby when we review this crime again, and we will in a certain number of years, we amend it once again to actually include the realities of how use of force needs to be recognized for atrocities, um, and that we also provide this, this methodology whereby if you simply recognize your rights under 121.5, that will be accepted by other member states you ratify the amendments, but then you recognize your right that you do not have to actually opt out until you have affirmatively opted in to the crime of aggression. Um, but a lot of those ideas, I think, are going to come out very shortly. Thank you, David. Is there anyone else who would like to offer a comment? Yes. Uh, thank you, and thank you to the panel. Uh, it is an honor to be here today. Uh, I am a student from Millersville University, Timothy Purcell, uh, Millersville University in Pennsylvania. Uh, my question is pertaining to uh, the ICC and uh, if you guys view that there's something more that they can do um, as far as, uh, you know, it was mentioned that the United States cares about the global uh, realm um, and obviously we all understand that, but is it getting to the point where the United States is becoming now the police power, you know, the, the world uh, police, um, you know, is there something more that the ICC can do um, to kind of take the focus off of big powers or uh, good countries, as as you mentioned, um, to do something uh, in place of that? Uh, because uh, you know, it mentioned the the enforcement is is one of the major issues with with the ICC. Um, so, is there another way around that? Thank you. Anyone? Um, I can't speak to, uh, I'm not sure I understand exactly what you mean by the ICC doing. I think the point that I hope has been clear is that it is precisely because um, the, there are many countries in the world that 
that do believe in humanitarian intervention and that while they may not wish to be the world's policemen are nonetheless um, willing to do the right thing when they can join with others who have the same view, I think the concern that the United States has about the chilling effect potentially of the uh, Kampala amendments is the extent to which they could preclude there being collective responses to humanitarian crises. And I think that's, that is, you know, the United States does not want to be the police man or woman of the world, and it, it very much wants for those countries of conscience that seek to protect human rights worldwide when they come under widespread and systematic assault, that that continue to be an option and not one. And, and as I stated, it's, it's, it's already a high bar to move the international community in any constellation to act in situations of crisis. And it would be an ironic and I think quite unintended effect if the Kampala amendments were to add to that burden. Yeah, I want to make two points. One is I want to enforce the view that was expressed by one of the questioners about the notion that there are good countries and bad countries, as if there are some countries that always obey international law and some that don't. There are worse countries and somewhat better countries, uh, but uh, that's as far as we can go. And I think uh, there is a stain on the United States, in my view, a very large one, from not only the fact that it carried out torture but that it refuses to accept its international responsibilities, having finally admitted that the United States engaged in torture. It is manifestly clear that we have an obligation uh, to reveal all the documents which we are far from doing and to punish those uh, who uh, carried out the torture. And I think our failure to do that will continue to make it, uh, will not only be a stain on the country that all of us who are Americans should care about, uh, but we'll continue to hamper our efforts uh, to present ourselves as the guardians of international law uh, and international peace uh, and, and security. Now, having said that, I want to say something good about the United States. The Obama administration has gone very far um, in moving the United States from a position of hostility to the ICC to a very different spot. Now, to be fair, the second Bush term was not as bad as the first term, but nonetheless, we've come very far since then. And I think that is now at risk. It's at risk because of the uh, fact that Palestine has joined the court and the court has begun an investigation of that situation. Whatever you think the merits, whatever you think the merits of that are, the reality is uh, that it will have a real impact and could jeopardize the ability of the court to cooperate. I think the adoption of something on aggression, no matter how anodyne, no matter how clear it is that the U.S. will not be covered, will also have an impact in the internal debate in the United States uh, on the role, the attitude of the United States towards the court. And I think anybody who cares about the court should care very deeply about that struggle. Uh, because whether the United States is very hostile or very cooperative does have an important impact on how well the court can function and how it is seen by other countries. Very well, and now it is my duty to bring this to a close, and I want to thank each of the panelists who have uh, given us very interesting comments. And I want to thank those of you who have offered your own comments and your own questions, and I want to thank Todd Buckwald, who organized this entire episode, uh, and so I thank you, the audience, and uh, I wish you the best for the rest of this session. Thank you. Thank you.